The supraspinatus is the muscle most commonly involved in rotator cuff pain and tears. And without these two keys, all of your time and effort spent on supraspinatus exercises and rotator cuff exercises might be wasted. Hey, it's Coach E from Precision Movement. And today I'm gonna to take you through two keys that are critical whenever you perform supraspinatus exercises or rotator cuff exercises. Now, if you wanna get back to and keep doing the active things you love for the rest of your life, make sure you hit that subscribe button, turn on the notification bell, because even if you don't have the problem that we're talking about in the video, you're gonna learn proper exercise technique, precision movement, it's what we do, and exercises that you might not have seen before. And remember, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So today, two keys to supraspinatus exercises that you must perform. The supraspinatus is the most commonly injured muscle when it comes to rotator cuff tears or rotator cuff pain. And if you have shoulder pain right in the front here, the supraspinatus is often involved. Now, a quick anatomy lesson here. Here's the supraspinatus. It goes through this little hole here between the shoulder blade, the scapula, and the humerus, the upper arm bone. And it's called the supraspinatus because this is known as the spine of the scapula and it goes above. So supraspinatus above the spine of the scapula. And it inserts right here. So the tissue that often gets damaged is right around this area. It's the tendon that inserts into the bone right here. And why does that get damaged? Well, the reason why is because when we move our arm around, if we don't have a lot of space in this area, which is known as the subacromial space underneath the acromion, then every time you move your arm up, especially when you're reaching up overhead, whether it's for an exercise like an overhead press or grabbing something from the top shelf in the kitchen, it's gonna get pinched. That's shoulder impingement. So if you do that enough times over and over, over months or years, eventually this tendon is gonna wear down and it could result in a tear. That's why we call these issues wear and tear injuries. It's not just one movement that causes the injury. It's those repetitive motions over time when you don't have the keys that I'm gonna talk about right now in place. So the two keys are scapular positioning. Scapular positioning, if you don't have proper stability and positioning of the scapula, it's gonna decrease the space here and cause more pinching, more frequent pinching and more intense pinching on that supraspinatus tendon. The two movements you need to understand are tilting of the scapula. So there's anterior tilt. There's a cup of water on the scapula. You tilt forward, that's anterior tilt. If there's a cup of water on the scapula, you tilt backwards, dump it backwards, that's posterior tilt. Whenever we're moving our arms around, we want posterior tilt of the scapula. Not necessarily the cue that we always get told, which is down and back, so retraction and depression, but posterior tilt, that's the most important movement and activation because that creates that space here so the tendon doesn't get pinched. Now, how do we create posterior tilt? We use a muscle known as the serratus anterior. And this muscle, it's underneath the scapula, but when you activate it, it sucks this bottom edge right here into the rib cage, and it causes that posterior tilt. So I've got another video, we'll link to it up above and at the end and in the description, all those places that teaches you how to wake that muscle up. But that is key number one. So whenever you perform supraspinatus or rotator cuff exercises, you need that posterior tilt and you need that serratus anterior activation. Key number two relates to the spine. You need good posture, especially through the thoracic spine. If you don't have it, you're gonna be like this, rounded, and that's already gonna anteriorly tilt the scapula. So you won't even be able to posteriorly tilt the scapula. You're already starting in that anterior tilt when you have poor thoracic posture. And like I said before, when you have that poor posture and you have that anterior tilt, it's gonna cause pinching and decrease that space and wear and tear on that supraspinatus tendon in there. I've got another video. I'm not gonna dive into it in this video and I'll link to it up above, down below, and at the end that teaches you the keys to getting thoracic spine extension and good posture and being able to maintain that the long term. If we just try to pinch the shoulder blades together, down and back, we're gonna tire out and we're not gonna be able to hold that all day. 
But when we get the deep muscles working, the multifidus, they're slow twitch fibers, they're designed for endurance, and that's when we can maintain that posture effortlessly. Those are the two keys to executing supraspinatus and rotator cuff exercises properly. Now I'm gonna walk you through a study in different supraspinatus exercises and talk about them in the context of pain so you know that when to do certain exercises. The study that we're going through today is called a systematic review of electromyography studies in normal shoulders to inform post-op rehab following rotator cuff repair. It was published in the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy in 2017, and it's a systematic review that included 20 studies. They showed the following table outlining the EMG activation percentage, which is the percent that a muscle is activated relative to its max of the supraspinatus muscle during various exercises. What I'm gonna do is teach you these exercises and put them into the context of when to do them with respect to how painful your shoulder is. And this can help to guide you through the rehab process so you know how to progress from one simple exercise and gentle exercise because you're in a lot of pain to more complex and difficult exercises because your pain is zero to low. Now I've put the seven exercises I'm gonna teach you from this study because there are like 30 exercises into this one graph so you could see how to use these exercises properly. And the first one we're gonna go through is the pendulum exercise. And as you can see, it activates the supraspinatus to about 11% of its max. And this is a very common exercise for rotator cuff rehab and it's as you can see, a very gentle one. So it gets the muscle activated, but it doesn't put too much strain on it. So it's great during what we call the acute phase of pain, which is if your pain is on a zero to 10 scale with 10 being severe, seven to 10. So it's a pretty painful shoulder and you wanna keep it moving. And I'll talk about why in a second, but how to do it, you can support yourself on a table or you can just support yourself on a knee and you just let your arm hang and then do some big circles, just like that. You can do 10 circles in one direction, 10 circles in the other direction. And if your shoulder is really painful, so much so that you find it really difficult to even start the circles, you bend over and you just use your body to get it moving. And once you get it moving, you should be able to continue that circle. You just keep the momentum going. So that's the shoulder pendulum do 10 to 20 circles in each direction. And the reason why we're doing this and we're getting moving as quickly as possible is because we don't want the joint to seize up. We wanna keep the muscles active so that they don't atrophy. And the movement helps to decrease any inflammation or it also gets blood flow into the area. And that helps to get rid of waste products and facilitate and speed healing. So we wanna get moving as soon as possible and the pendulum is a great way to start doing that. Once your pain level goes down below a seven and lands in the four to six out of 10 pain range, this is when you're in the phase that we call the rehab phase. And some exercises that are great to do are isometrics, which means that there's no movement. And isometrics are great because we can get the muscle activated to a fairly high level and decrease the amount of wear and tear on the tendon. We get, it's a little bit safer because there's no movement and it's more controlled. The first exercise I'm gonna demonstrate is an isometric, an external rotation isometric at zero degrees. And as you can see, it activates the supraspinatus to 35% of max. Very simple technique. You just start off with your arm by your side, bend your elbow to 90 degrees, grab your wrist, and then you push out that way. So I'm trying to rotate my arm that way and it's not moving. So that's why it's called an isometric. There's no movement. You wanna hold that for five to 10 seconds, but remember those two keys that we talked about. You don't wanna do it in this position, hunched over, and you don't wanna do it with your shoulder rounded forward and in your scapula anteriorly tipped. You want to posteriorly tilt the scapula, suck that bottom edge of the scapula into your rib cage and stand tall and extend through the thoracic spine. Then you grab the wrist, then you perform the isometric and you're gonna get that supraspinatus activated in a good position. So do that, hold for five to 10 seconds. You can perform anywhere from four to eight repetitions, a couple of sets, and that's gonna get and start to strengthen that supraspinatus. The next exercise I'm gonna show is very similar. It's 
an external rotation isometric at 90 degrees of abduction. And as you can see, this gets the supraspinatus activated to 54% of its max. So for this technique, again, those two keys, good posture, posterior tilt of the scapula, then you're gonna have your arm abducted to 90 degrees. If you can't lift it up yet, you should be able to because you're four to six pain, you're not in the acute phase. But if you can't lift it up, you can get your arm up there and then hold it. And that can help you to get the arm into the position that you need to without going through a painful range. From here, you can grab onto your wrist again and then try to rotate and picture rotating the upper arm. Not so much rotating the forearm, but think of rotating that upper arm and that helps to get activation of the supraspinatus. The other thing you can do is, if you noticed, I made a fist there. That's been shown in the research to increase activation of the rotator cuff muscles. So make that fist, grab the wrist, and then rotate. Again, holding for five to 10 seconds, two sets, four to eight repetitions. And that's gonna be a good stepping stone up from that zero degree position. The last exercise in the rehab phase that I'm gonna demonstrate from the study is the prone external rotation, or also known as the L. And as you can see, it activates the supraspinatus to 74% of its max. For this technique, you go prone, so lying on your stomach. You can go over a stability ball or on a bench, and then you make your elbows at 90 degrees, so it's like an L. And from here, very simple, you just externally rotate. So thinking of that upper arm rotation, posterior tilt of the scapula, keeping good posture here, and making fists. And all those cues are going to help you to get maximum rotator cuff activation without causing excess wear and tear on the tendon and the muscle. Same parameters apply, two sets, four to eight reps, holding each rep for five to 10 seconds. In the rehab phase, we typically spend anywhere from three to eight weeks. And we do that because we not only want to get the pain down below a four out of 10, but we also want to build the strength and endurance in those muscles so that we can start to use them in functional and compound movement patterns. And once your pain is at a three out of 10 or below, we call that the resilience phase. And we use this in all of our pain solution programs. So when you're in the resilience phase, some pointers of exercises to choose are, you want to start to move more, and you want to start to incorporate compound movements. That's where multiple joints are moving. So exercises like push-ups, I'm going to demonstrate one version of for the lower body, squats and lunges. We want to start to incorporate those movements so that we have the exercises that will transfer to everyday life and for sport. The first exercise I'd like to demonstrate from this study is the side-lying external rotation. And as you can see, this activates the supraspinatus to 51% of its max. For this technique, you just grab a dumbbell, get down onto the mats on your side, and elbow on the side. You could have a towel under there if you want. I typically don't do that, but you can. Make sure your wrist is in neutral, and make sure you have that posterior tilt of the scapula, and you're not in the fetal position, rounded, but nice and tall, posterior tilt of the scapula, grab the weight with a good strong grip, and then rotate up to the top. I like to hold for a second or two, and then slowly down. So a count of four down is nice. You can control through every degree of range. Touch the ground lightly, and then back up. Pause for a moment, and then slow down, and control every degree of range of motion. So now, as you can see, we're working through dynamic movements, no longer isometrics, but dynamic movements. And we're gonna build strength in a way that we can transfer it over to everyday life and sport. For the sideline external rotation, do two to three sets, typically in the eight to 12 rep range is what I like, and you should be good to go. The next exercise that we'd recommend from this study for the resilience phase, that's when your pain is zero to three out of 10, is the full can. And the full can activates the supraspinatus to 73% of its max. For this technique, you need two dumbbells this time. You stand up nice and tall. You posteriorly tilt the scapula. It's not down and back. It's posterior tilt, sucking that bottom edge of the scapula into the rib cage. And your palms are going to be kind of facing each other. 
and you're lifting up and down under control. Now you don't want to go, you don't want to go straight out to the side, but at approximately 30 degrees forward. And that's known as the scapular plane, and that helps to decrease that impingement and maximize the space, the subacromial space in the shoulder, so that the supraspinatus tendon doesn't get worn down. So go nice and slow under control. Don't use momentum. If you have to use momentum, you're using too much weight. Go nice and slow under control. And again, two to three sets, eight to 12 reps are good parameters for you to use for the full can. The last exercise from this study that I'd like to walk you through is the push-up plus. And as you can see, the push-up plus gives you 99% activation of the supraspinatus muscle. And that's almost 100%. So that gets the supraspinatus working as hard as it can in a functional movement pattern. So the push-up plus, it's very simple. You're down in the push-up position. By now, you've got very minimal pain, so you're doing these compound movements. What I like to do with push-up plus is to actually do the push-up. As you do the push-up, you're sucking that bottom edge of the scapula in, posture tilting, keeping good posture, and then you go up to the top and make sure you protract the scapula and push through the heels of your palms right down here. That helps to activate that serratus anterior a little bit more. Keeping tall, you're not pushing through and rounding too much here, but just pushing through the heels of the palms, protracting the scapula at the top. Hold it for a couple seconds. And then as you go down, think of posterior tilt of the scapula, chest to the floor, driving through the heels of the palms, all the way up, protracting the scapula at the top. This is an exercise that you can work up and continue building reps. So you might only be able to do one rep, maybe four reps, but just keep doing multiple sets, at least three sets. And over time, if you're doing this two, three times a week, then you're gonna build your endurance, you build your strength, and you get that supraspinatus and everything else integrated in a functional movement pattern. So those were seven exercises from this study that I wanted to demonstrate for you in the context of the two keys to performing them properly and how to use them with respect to the level of pain of your shoulder. Now there are a couple of resources that I mentioned earlier. One was on waking up the serratus anterior so you can actually do that posterior tilt properly and hold it for the length of time that you're doing a set. You can watch that video up here. One is for posture, forward head posture, getting that thoracic spine extended. You can watch that one here. And finally, the most important is the shoulder pain solution because we walk you through these three phases based on your pain level with many different exercises to get things working properly. Check that out if you've got shoulder problems. Highly recommend it, and I hope to see you inside that course.